All right, well, let's move on through chapter 11. We've talked about fatty acids, and now we're going to put them together into membranes. One of the things about membranes, let me go ahead and show you this movie to start with. This is the thing when you look at cells, and this is what you see. You see what they what they look like. It doesn't quite look like the way proteins move. It doesn't look like the way anything else moves. It's essentially a two-dimensional surface that's moving in three dimensions. Some people have described it as a 2.5 dimensional surface. But if you look at the images of how the cells move, they have this incredible dynamism to it. They can move quite a bit, and you know that it's an oily membrane that is not covalently bound. Therefore, you can have things like we mentioned in the last one. We had, um, we had the steroids be able to move across that. So, to talk about that, how do you make a membrane? Membranes are not made of triacylglycerols, but they're made of something that looks a lot like them. So triacylglycerols, they look like a capital letter E, or in real life, a lower case letter H, right? And then they store the lipids for you. When you're using the lipids in a membrane, you usually have still the same fundamental structure. You can even still have a glycerol uh, lipid backbone with two fatty acids, but the third one's been replaced now with phosphate and an alcohol. Instead of being neutral or hydrophobic, it is now hydrophilic and charged. And this could be a bit of a chain, but you notice that the alcohol doesn't have to be big. It could be small, this could be like a capital letter F, more like that than like a capital letter E. If you have a situation like this, it's a glycerol phospholipid, and this will form part of the membrane. The other ones look like this, in that they have two long chains and one charged chain. The difference, other difference is the backbone. If you notice that they have a different backbone called sphingosine that has a lipid chain built into it. Then they have a fatty acid in the middle of it. And then at the other end, they can either have phosphate plus an alcohol called choline, or they can even have a mono or oligosaccharide. Anything that you can put on uh, to that functional group on the bottom of sphingosine you can put onto a membrane lipid. And so you see that membrane lipids are going to have this um, more diversity because they're not just to store energy, they're there to actually behave as a two-dimensional structure. The, if you have phosphate, it's called a phospholipid. If it has a sugar, it's called a glycolipid. And you can see that there are different ways you can mix and match them. Three primary ways to make the membrane lipids. The thing to notice about these is that they do have the same actual structure as triacylglycerides. It's just that they have one chain that's going to flip up, and that chain's going to be the one that's chemically different from the other two, which will sort of stick together at the bottom of the molecule. So you have this lowercase h kind of thing where the stem of the lowercase h going up is now the phosphocholine group if you have a glycerophosphate. Um, lipid. And this is, a, in fact, a particular kind of phosphate lipid that's really important and prominent in membranes called phosphatidylcholine. You see it's got this choline group. I'll show you what that is in just a second. So these end up having like two legs instead of three legs, but they really do just have this amphipathic kind of arrangement where you have charges on one side and you have hydrophobics on the other side. And you can tell that that's going to do the things that amphipathic things do. If you have a glycolipid, you have the sugar sticking up. Same basic idea, just a different surface on it. On the core, on the membrane core, it's going to look the same. Finally, over here, all the way on the right, part C, we have a steroid that showed. And remember, the steroids have the little hydrophilic head. It might just be an OH group. And remember that they have a chain that goes off the other end. Now you see the purpose of that hydrophobic tail. The tail going off the other end will make the steroid cholesterol to be the same general size as the other membrane lipids. So cholesterol will be able to mix in to the membrane. Everything will be non-covalently bound, just held together by the hydrophobic effect. So it's able to move. And that's where you get the dynamic structure that you've seen. So phospholipids, because they have a phosphate, 
I mean, one of the charges on the phosphate is covered up by the alcohol, just like shown right here, but you still have the one charge on the bottom, this one charge left over. Phospholipids have a negatively charged phosphate built into it, and that's the part that goes up. Here is um, an example of sphingosine as opposed to a glycerophospholipid, but you see how it looks the same from a distance. Oh, actually, this is glycerol, so uh, I'm going to show you sphingosine in just a second. But you see how it works out to have the two tails. You can have any fatty acids you want on the tail to modulate the liquidity of the membrane, um, depending on the number of saturated and unsaturated bonds you have. So we call the other end the head group. For the case of choline, you have phosphatidylcholine. The head group would be choline itself. And so you can attach a lot of things to the phosphate. You see anything that can be an alcohol, if you have ethanolamine, then you have uh, this, this head group on the end of the phosphate. Choline, right here, it has this, and this is not a mistake, this is three methyl groups on a central nitrogen. And by the way, there is a slight mistake here that you should be able to see that there's a positive charge on the nitrogen. Choline itself is positively charged so that the net charge at pH 7 is, um, is going to be zero. I believe in your edition of the book this is fixed. Make sure it's fixed because choline should look just like ethanolamine. It's a nitrogen with four substituents that has to be uh, positively charged. The reason why the net charge is zero is because it's attached to a negative phosphate. So remember, uh, if you can attach any alcohol to it, why not a serine? That's got an alcohol on it, right? And so sometimes you see serine as a head group. In that case, you have a net charge of negative one because the serine has a plus and a minus charge minus one more from the phosphate, you end up with a negative charge overall. You can even have another glycerol put on. Glycerol has an alcohol. And uh, of course, sugars have lots of hydroxyl groups. Those can be attached, and you can even phosphorylate those groups. Down here at the bottom, we're getting a little more complicated, but the ones at the top, I want you to know. Basically, the simple ones from glycerol on up. And you should know that a sugar, in general, can be put onto the phosphate but that was sort of an extension of the sugar chapter. Down here at the bottom, you can even have this really complex and non-memorizable structure at the bottom, which you see is a full another phospholipid. Phosphatidylglycerol can be the head group. So you basically have a two-headed lipid, or four-footed lipid, perhaps, with a, um, a head group that's kind of joined at the head kind of thing. Cardiolipin is the name of this. The reason why I'm mentioning that is actually it has a special function. It's a cool kind of lipid. I just want you to know in general what the structure is, and we'll return to that at the very end of the lecture. So phospholipids can even send signals, just like hormones can. Sometimes you can make a weird shape that will be sent through the blood. Platelet activating factor, you can tell what it does, right? It activates platelets. And so you have a phospholipid that will actually um, activate platelets. This one has this weird kind of structure on the background. They've modified the structure just like with the other lipids that signal. You can take a membrane lipid and you can make it signal as well. And this ends up signaling with the phosphocholine group on one end. Actually, there was a student who sat through this class. Now she, um, she went and got a PhD doing work on platelet activating factor for her PhD thesis went on to get a postdoc, then went on to law school, and now she's a patent lawyer in the field. Just to show you, this class can give you information that you never know how it's going to show up. You might end up doing a doctoral dissertation on platelet activating factor like she did. Who knows? So the other thing is that you can have the glycerophospholipid backbone, and you can also see in membranes this kind of um, weirder backbone that's called a sphingolipid. The thing about a sphingolipid is it has no ester at all for one of its chains. It has a chain built in. And you see how it's just carbon bonds all the way. Then they have a, an uh, amine that is actually forms an amide with a fatty acid to form the second chain. And then they have their head group with an OH like usual. This is kind of weird, but this is the kind of thing that um, you should know how this works because you find this all over in membranes. But realize from a distance, sphingolipids look pretty much like the same. The orange built-in chain is just not connected with an ester you can hydrolyze. But for the purposes of the membrane working like a membrane, this works exactly like a phospholipid. It's just put together with different linkages.
So notice that the sort of glycerol backbone is sort of hidden. There's an analogous structure to the glycerol backbone in the back there. So for sphingolipids, there are certain ones that are important. I've covered up the ones that aren't, but there's an important sphingolipid called ceramid, which is basically just a sphingolipid chain plus another lipid backbone. It's got a head group that's a hydrogen. And then we have our friend phosphocholine. Here it's shown with the proper positive charge on it. Phosphocholine is also often found on sphingolipids. And so this phosphocholine thing is important because you see it shown up all over the place. The other thing that you'll see at the bottom, you can have complex oligosaccharides attached to phospholipids. And so you can have these complex sugar structures. And now we're combining chapter 7 with chapter 11, where we have the sugar chapter giving us the structures of our head groups. And again, you can have that a very weird sialic acid that shows up as a purple diamond. And we, we've seen that working as signaling molecule before in the sugar chapter, and it can work as a signaling molecule again. Or maybe it's just working as a sugar. We have to do an experiment to find out. So just realize that whether you are a phosphatidylcholine or a sphingomyelin, which has the phosphocholine on it, those look pretty much the same to a, a, from a distance, especially if you have the side chains buried in a membrane like they should be and the head groups pointing up. Those head groups look very much the same. So you can imagine that the, something from outside the cell is coming along. It's just seeing the head groups. It's sort of playing duck, duck, goose with all the membrane lipids. And it's uh, sort of feeling around. It's able to see phosphatidylcholine. You know, it's able to see choline, choline. It's able to see that substituted nitrogen positive charge there. It's not able to see that much about whether the sphingomyelin has a backbone of a glycerol or whether it's a sphingo, sphingosine, you know. Um, just realize that membranes are complex structures. These will work together in a membrane the same way. And so that's what we'll talk about in general, how do membranes work. One of the most interesting things is that the glycosphingolipids that have the blood antigens on them, which means that they have the oligosaccharides that determine blood type. Remember, these will be sticking up. And the thing is, people with O-type blood will make a uh, oligosaccharide that looks like this. By the way, you see that fucose there? That's why I want you to know fucose. It's important for blood type. The O antigen has uh, no other sugar on it. The A antigen has a uh, N-galactose on it, galactosamide, I believe that would be, galactosamine, sorry. And then you have plain old galactose for the B antigen. You know that this is a very small difference. This is a difference of one nitrogen. Um, this might be a galnac in some cases, but it's a difference in one functional group on the galactose. And the people who are O just never have that sugar at all. These mediate immune recognition because they coat the outside of the membranes of red blood cells. Your immune system gets used to whatever structure is there. If you give somebody red blood cells that have a structure they don't recognize, their immune system will freak out. And that is why you shouldn't give type B blood to a type A person. Their immune system will recognize that it's just plain old galactose and it will go after it and it will freak out and it will think something's wrong. The, uh, the O antigen is a universal donor because it doesn't have the sugar at all. Apparently that's the way the immune system works. Um, so notice the differences. By the way, the positive minus has to do with a protein factor called RH factor, which is something else entirely. This has to do with the letters of blood type. But you see it's all based on sugars being recognized on the outside of membranes because they are attached to lipids. So for example, different receptors can bind to it. Here's an immune receptor called DC sign, and it is binding A and B blood antigens, and it's using valine to sort of hook around the fucose here. Now the thing about this is it really cares whether there's a galnac here and it's the A antigen. By the way, I should fix that. I believe that that is wrong because I have evidence right here. It's a galnac. It's not gal N. And you notice how I stumbled over it. Okay, so now that's fixed, right? It's a galnac. And you see right here, this is a type A antigen of blood. The immune receptor recognizes this by binding to it. And you see that the valine fits as a hook between the galnac and the fucose here. 
It seems like it, it might be able to recognize the type of AB blood, but it wouldn't be able to recognize the type O blood, especially if it cares about whether this Galnac is there or not. If it's not there at all, it's possible that this immune receptor won't be able to bind to that particular oligosaccharide. So notice how this is exactly the, um, well, actually, this, this might not be exactly the same sugars as what they have here. It looks like they have a gal there, and then they have a glucose. Um, needless to say, uh, this shows exactly the same difference in blood type. You have the fucose down here, the galnac here, down to the colors. And uh, the colors down here aren't recognized by the receptor, so I'm exactly not, not exactly sure what's going on with them. The valine here is a little hook that sort of hooks on between the two sugars at the end for the A antigen that you have here. And so these are important because they send signals, and they can send signals by providing surfaces on the outside or inside of a membrane, because the head groups can send signals. So um, because of this, they are very good points for toxins to attack. For example, lipases, phospholipases, will cleave different bonds, and they're esterases. Notice how there's one, two, three, four different ester bonds. One's a phospho, two of them are phosphoester bonds, but they're still ester bonds that can be cleaved by the lipase. The lipase can destroy this membrane and therefore destroy the signal that this particular phospholipid is sending by either cleaving off the head group or by cleaving off one of its feet. The thing about this is that phospholipases, these are the exact phospholipases found in many venoms. I believe this might be cobra venom. I'm not sure which venom but a lot of venoms depend on lipases that cut up phospholipids. That tells us that phospholipids are very important. And in this case, we have a phosphorylated sugar as the head group, which tells us that that phosphorylated sugar is sending an important signal, okay? So neuronal signal lipids, if they're destroyed by this, you have neuronal effects and you have loss of neuronal function. You have a very effective venom if it has that enzyme in it. So how do these work when you stack up a bunch of phospholipids together in a membrane? Well, remember if you have like a fatty acid that you have one leg on your molecule and it's narrow at the bottom and it's got a larger head group, the head group is wider than the tail. So it's wedge shape. If you take fatty acids and you put them together, you get a sphere, you get a micelle. These on the other hand, don't have one leg, they have two legs, right? They have two fatty acid legs. And that means that they form not a wedge, but a cylinder. And when you stack up the cylinder, you get a flat surface that has a hydrophobic side and a hydrophilic side. If you stack up two of the surfaces, so the hydrophobic sides come together, you make a little hydrophobic sandwich with a nice little crust on the outside of hydrophilic head groups. The other thing about this sandwich is it's going to be held together as a sheet, but the individual little guy is going to be able to move around and so you have a lot of movement in the lateral direction, in the two-dimensional direction, but you don't have a lot of movement. It can't really jump out. It's not stable for it to jump out of the membrane very much. So um, you can actually make a membrane that is big enough to wrap around on itself. And once the sheet is flexible enough that you can make a hollow sphere with an inside, if it's a small hollow sphere, you call it a liposome. And this is a natural structure that happens when you have a couple of, when you have enough of the, fat, uh, of the uh, phospholipids together. So if you have just plain old phospholipids, it doesn't take a complex structure of phospholipid to form a relatively complex structure of liposome. And these are like two layered micelles, but the important thing is they have a space for aqueous chemistry on the inside. These can form naturally at like the vents of undersea, uh, deep sea vents, where we have a lot of other interesting chemistry going on. And that's why I think these might have been the first protocells. If you had enough of simple lipids around, they can actually form hollow liposomes that looks an awful lot like a very simple version of a cell. You can have an inside and an outside. You can have chemistry inside that's different from chemistry outside. Is that enough to allow the origin of life? Maybe. It's just interesting to me that um, liposomes can form so easily.
And so if you have a small, and liposomes are actually used by life because they can form spontaneously, life will form them and it will use them to send up little packages. So this is kind of like the FedEx of life can form a little liposome and put a payload inside it and send it somewhere. It's like a little mini me cell. You know, it doesn't have a nucleus. It just has whatever you put on in the, the inside. These are called exosomes. And you see that this is a good picture of one. It has a membrane around that's going to be like a little hollow bubble with water on the inside. And you can form, you can put hydrophilic things in there. Right there, they've put nucleic acids in there. And you can put stuff on the surface that will send it to certain places. And you can see them in plants. Now, I want to be a little bit skeptical about this. Just because you can see them doesn't mean that they're deliberate, that they're important. But you do have these exosomes. They're putative exosomes that have been observed in plants. And we just need more experiments to show how important these signals that they send are. There are scientists who are staking their careers on this right now that are doing a lot of um, work with the exosomes to try to figure out what plant biology would look like. A lot of open questions, and now they feel like exosomes could provide a very good explanation. I think, honestly, if you read between the lines here, this has a proper amount of skepticism. Exosomes definitely form spontaneously. Could they be accidentally forming, or are they deliberately used by the cell? Who knows? So the thing about the uh, membranes is if you look at them structurally, you can see that they have a hydrophobic and hydrophilic part. Like we said, they're like two hydrophilic surfaces with one hydrophobic surface between them. So if you add something that is very electron dense, but also very hydrophilic, you'll see it go into the head group layers and not into the middle layer at all. And in fact, here you have osmium added to a cell. The osmium is very electron dense and they looked at the electron density with microscopy here. And you see that you have two extra dense layers. It looks like a little Oreo where you have sort of the osmium associating with the head groups, there's no osmium in the middle. That shows you there's a hydrophobic middle part of the Oreo that is between the two hydrophilic layers. Hopefully I'm saying that right. I can go back and edit it, right? Anyways. So all that's to say, it's mostly composed of membrane lipids, and then you can put other things in the membrane lipids. They're really like liquid, and so it's like a two-dimensional oily solution. If you can dissolve something in oil, you can dissolve it in the membrane. For example, sterols will dissolve in the membrane, and like we said, they will form a cylinder shape with a head group almost exactly the same size as a membrane lipid. So cholesterol will be found in great quantities in membranes. You can also have anything that's hydrophobic can go. You can have, um, let's see, Oh, there's the glycolipids, and just like I said, the glycolipids are, ten, uh, are found on the outside layer. The thing to point out about this with the three-layer structure that we had on the last slide, the second layer, the inside lipid monolayer, is going to point inside, and it's going to have the characteristic chemistry of the inside of the cell. The outside monolayer is going to have a glycolipid uh, on it because we said before the sugars, oligosaccharides, end up on the outside of the cell much more often than on the inside. Membrane lipids follow the same pattern. Notice there are no glycolipids on the inside of the cell from this particular perspective. Now, of course, you can have like a protein with a hydrophobic stretch, and you can dissolve that hydrophobic stretch in the membrane, and now you have the protein embedded in the membrane of the cell. And you can have transport proteins, you can have proteins you can attach a lipid to, and they can act as a little lipid anchor that dissolves in the lipid membrane and moves in two dimensions as the whole lipid membrane moves. And you can then also have these peripheral proteins that uh, they don't attach to the lipid part of the membrane, they attach to the head groups. So remember that you've got this basic structure, the hydrophobic stuff on the inside, hydrophilic head groups on the outside, and from that chemical, you can build up a pretty complex ecosystem of molecules. You can even have, like, um, what sphingolipids will do, they'll sort of self-segregate. And you'll have the sphingolipids that will be, they'll have better interactions with themselves and with the other lipids, and they'll form sort of a sphingolipid area that's called a sphingolipid raft because it's this, this whole sort of, uh, this whole sort of spot 
where you have a bunch of sphingolipids that sort of stick together there. So, when you're talking about dissolving in a membrane, how should you imagine? And, well, I, I forgot that I had this slide because this shows us with the lipids actually dissolving in the membrane. Here's testosterone actually being able to dissolve in the membrane and being able to sort of dip its head underwater and you can imagine it being able to sort of swim through the oily layer to get from one side of the cell to the other. This is how different sterols sit into the membrane. And what's really interesting is if you look back and forth here, the ones that are more like cholesterol are the ones that are more compatible with sitting in a membrane and sort of forming good interactions in sort of a lateral position, you know, they're sort of uh, um, at, at, uh, um, perpendicular to the two-dimensional surface of the membrane. You have um, the things like cholesterol like to dissolve standing up. And so you can see that cholesterol has a way of forming good interactions to its sides and it actually will help to tie the membrane together. So cholesterol actually strengthens membranes by dissolving in them like that last slide shows. And as a sterol dissolving in the membrane, it allowed the membranes to not just sort of wave around and move around like this, it allowed them to actually bulge out and grow these big appendages and to make basically the first kind of arms and fingers, pseudopodia or whatever the microbiologists call it. Cholesterol allowed that. There's actually a certain point in evolution where cholesterol was invented. And it turns out that it looks like oxygen was important for inventing cholesterol. You remember that little OH on it? That little OH is important and doing the chemistry requires oxidative chemistry. And so it looks like oxygen allowed cholesterol, which allowed membranes to do these more advanced behaviors. I think that's kind of cool. Once you can make pseudopods and things like that, you can make all sorts of structures we're just figuring out about. For example, here are some appendages. You can see bacteria sort of grow these little spindles between each other. And these spindles are made of membrane with cytoplasm inside them. And you see that their, their spindles are like forming between the bacteria. There's a lot of stuff going on where you have these vesicles. And the way that they form is you have a bunch of little, they look like liposomes, they're little vesicles that go out and the little bubbles, bubbles that come out and then the bubbles join together and they make this beads on a string and that ends up being a connection between the two bacteria cytosol, cytosols. And the cytosol can send information from one to the other. It makes it hard for the bacteria to, it's hard for us to break these apart. It's hard for us to um, kill the bacteria when they form this stronger together like structure. And they have this, um, this they have uh, all this communication. This is some of the things that form in biofilms, and it's why biofilms are so hard to destroy. But anybody interested in antibiotics should be interested in how this works and how we might be able to stop it and therefore destroy the bacteria that might be infecting you. So other cells can do this other than bacteria. It looks like uh, human cells and it, um, even tumor cells can use this kind of structure to communicate and to pass calcium around, which is what they do to survive chemotherapy. So tumors that do this will survive chemotherapy better and they'll spread the calcium around. Now that we know that they do this, what can we do to stop it, to kind of break these bridges and to keep the tumors from resisting the chemotherapy that we're giving them? And so that's why I want to put you, I moved this to the beginning of the lecture. Remember how a membrane moves. It's fluttering. It almost looks like it's moving in the wind. Or if you don't like moving in like the wind, you can think of it like being a globe. And like the oceans on the globe have currents in them, the membranes also have currents in them. This is not a picture of the Earth. This is a picture of a membrane, colored blue, to show the movement of the lipids within the liquid two-dimensional membrane that you have. And so if you have something embedded in the membrane, so for example, uh, you can see that depending on the length of the lipids, uh, you can have uh, things, you can have a lipid area of, if you have taller lipids, you have a taller membrane. If you have shorter lipids, you have a shorter membrane. I really like this because it shows 
Um, on the right, you have more cholesterol in orange and more sphingolipids. That ends up being a taller, less fluid lipid, uh, lipid membrane right there. And that's why these, these lipid rafts, like these sphingolipids that come together and they form sort of a collective, these spots on the lipid membrane are, are actually thicker. You can, they actually stand out and they have different chemistries. And we're just figuring out how that all works. So when we look at the different areas of the membrane, we can see that the lipid rafts have more sphingolipids. We can also do experiments where we compare the inside and outside layer, because remember those are distinct chemistries. We talked about how the inside layer and the outside layer, um, the outside layer has the glycosphingolipids. It has the sugars on it. The inside layer does not. So you can look at all the different membranes as well. You can look at the different organelles that have membranes, and you can see that these have different compositions. You can see that the rough ER and smooth ER have a big blue area. You look down here, they have a lot of phosphatidylcholine. But the plasma membrane on the outside of the cell, it doesn't have as much blue. It has a lot more cholesterol. And so you see how the cholesterol helps strengthen the membrane, uh, and it might affect its thickness. We'd have to measure it to be sure but it definitely allows the membrane to be flexible and strong. So all of these differences, oh, and the other thing I want to show you, look at the red. Where is cardiolipin found? That was the weird two-headed, four-legged one that I told you about. There's a ton of it in the inner mitochondrial membrane. Why would that be? The answer to that is at the end of this. I've got to have some way to keep you watching this, other than the fact that you need to watch this to pass the test. But uh, I'll have the answer to why is cardiolipin specifically in the mitochondrial membrane at the end of the lecture. So we can separate the inner and outer monolayers, and we can do things like, say, what's in the inner and what's in the outer, and they do have distinct compositions. There are effectively two different kinds of molecules are in the different sides. You see how you have all these phosphatidyl inositols pointing on the inside. That was what we showed the lipase going after and cleaving on the previous slide. The venom goes after that signal. And it looks like those are important for sending signals on the inside of cells. In fact, that's the only kind of sugar that you'll see on the inside of cells, the phosphorylated inositol sugar. On the other hand, you'll see phosphatidylcholine and sphingomyelin. So the choline head groups like to go on the outside, the out outside of cells, and they are recognized they should be recognized by proteins that are outside the cell if they're looking to recognize a membrane. So those send inside signals. Those send outside signals, or at the very least, they provide a positively charged surface that proteins can recognize and bind to. So you notice that the membranes have a different outside versus an inside. If you have a lipid on the outside, it's not going to spontaneously flip to the inside. The reason for that is that um, this, the kinetics of it moving from inside to outside, it has to dissolve the head group in a hydrophobic environment. And so it's a very slow, unfavorable reaction for it to move from one side to the other. Once it does, by the way, the thermodynamics are identical for it being inside versus outside, but the kinetics are very slow. So um, you just won't see this happening, therefore you can have a distinct collection of lipids outside a cell, and they're not going to spontaneously diffuse to the inner leaflet. On the other hand, moving side to side, so moving up and down, can't do. Moving side to side, that's going to happen without an enzyme, so you don't need an enzyme for that. But you can actually make an enzyme that catalyzes this reaction to move stuff from the inside to the outside and to sort of arrange the inner and outer leaflets. These are called, I just love the names of these, these are called flipases and flopases. And technically the flipases moves stuff from the outside in, and the flopase moves it from the inside out. But, um, you know, that's not the kind of thing that's going to be on the MCAT. What is important on this, notice that these are active. It takes energy to catalyze this reaction. You have to hydrolyze ATP. So this is kind of like active transport. But you, then if you, uh, if you don't want to hydrolyze ATP, you can do a scramblaze, which will move outside in at the same time it does inside out. The problem with this is it's not very specific. And if you have a scramblaze, it's going to scramble the composition of lipids between your inside and outside. Um, and so I can't imagine you want to do that that often. 
but at least you can do it for free. Because if you're moving one charge in, you're moving one charge out, you can actually have that be an isomerization reaction equivalent. You can uh, make the kinetics more stable, like an enzyme will do, and the thermodynamics don't matter, right? So uh, think about how Scramblaze works in those terms. Think about Scramblaze as an enzyme. So when you sit back and look at a, a lipid membrane, it can be pretty complex. Here's one that's visualized for gram-negative bacteria. And so gram-negative bacteria, they don't have the cell wall that we talked about before, but they do have a pretty complex membrane nonetheless. They have these phospholipids at the bottom, then they have something called lipid A, then they have a peptide called core, which confuses me as a biochemist, but they named it, not me. So the peptide is called core, and then they have a sugary antigen on the outside. And so this means that when you come up and look at a bacterium, a gram-negative bacterium, we'll have a lot of sugars on the outside. But you know deep down below that surface, there's going to be a phospholipid membrane somewhere at the bottom there. And so gram-positive bacteria, they have the cell wall. This is what the cell wall looks like. It's in green on this. And you see how it's cross-linked. It's really good protection. And that's why we need something like lysozyme to go after the cross-links and break them apart. But also you can imagine Gram's stain, staining the Gram-positive, um, staining the pentaglycine linkages that we talked about. But again, underneath the cell wall, deep down, you have the phospholipid bilayer the same way. After you get through the forest, you have the bilayer. So all this is to say, how do you want to envision the membranes moving? The, um, the way that they do this is the fluid mosaic model. You want to think about it like lots of mosaic bits floating in a two-dimensional membrane, but they're fluid. They can move around each other. And some of the bits can be pretty big if you have a protein embedded in the membrane. But this idea that you have free lateral motion, um, but not free motion in the other direction, in the perpendicular direction, free motion like this, that's what the fluid mosaic model says. So it's supported by an experiment like this, and it shows that the membranes are not essentially solid. They're essentially liquid. They're essentially fluid. So um, the idea is that you have this mosaic heterogeneity of lots of different things, but they're flowing. It's a lot of motion limited to two dimensions. The way that they supported the fluid mosaic model is they took a cell, and they labeled it on the outside with a fluorescent head group, something that would re react with the head groups on the phospholipids. So basically, they, they changed the cell to be fluorescent red. Then they had a microscope trained on one part of the cell, and they looked at it, and they saw a lot of red. They trained a laser at the same place, and the thing is, when the laser hits the fluorescent probe, it bleaches it. It turns it off. It turns it to be not fluorescent anymore. So it makes a big spot in the laser. A big spot lets the laser size in the membrane. The membrane's still intact, it's just been uh, bleached, is what they call it. So the thing is, they, trained, they kept the microscope trained on that same area, and as they watched, they could see little red bits coming in from outside, diffusing in and filling in the area, and eventually they all diffused in and the area became red again. They could measure the kinetics of this. They could see how different lipids affected it. And they could see, yes, you have diffusion from the outside into this bleached spot. And you can watch it in real time. So that means that your idea of how the lipids uh, should be, you know, you, you memorize it and you think of them as being sort of ordered like this on top. But actually, when uh, at physiological temperatures, they're moving a lot. They're just not moving up and down. They're moving side to side quite a bit. And so the picture on the bottom is the more uh, proper way to think of it. When you heat these things up, they will become more and more liquid. And it's actually important for life to be able to be in the liquid phase to move and respond. And so you don't want the most stable membrane ever. You want it to be stable enough to hold together, liquid enough, unstable enough, to be able to move, flow, and change, because life has to change to a constantly changing environment. And so this, the way that membranes flow is a very important to life, 
and they're going, you're going to have different levels of fluidity, the cell can change the fluidity by how, the kinds of lipids that it makes in its membrane. So for example, right here on the, um, let's see, yeah, let's go all the way to part A right here. You can see that if you have a bunch of unsaturated lipids that you have a pretty fluid membrane. If you make a bunch of saturated lipids, they stack together, it becomes less like olive oil, more like beef fat, right? And so they become more solid. And so if you need a less fluid membrane, make more saturated lipids. If you need a more fluid membrane, make more unsaturated lipids and put them in the membrane. Sterol will change the, uh, the width of it. So you can see that sterols will sort of pack the chains together and sort of make them stand up a little bit more. We have the example of the sphingolipids and the cholesterol that was thicker. And exactly how this all works is an emergent property of all the stuff working together. It's not the kind of thing you can memorize, but I want you to see how cholesterol can thicken a membrane and make it stronger. If you can change the surface charges as well. And so there's lots of stuff that you can do along these lines. So for example, if you look at two different membranes, if you look at the ER membrane, the, then you see one that is, um, that is thinner. If you have a protein embedded in the ER membrane, it only needs 20 amino acids to have a transmembrane domain that bridges from one side to the other. 20 hydrophobic amino acids because they dissolve in the membrane, right? But if you have a plasma membrane protein, it's going to need 25 amino acids because the plasma membrane is thicker. And that's how you want to think about it. Also, the plasma membrane, you know, the membranes have different sides. They have different um, saturations. And so they will have different fluidities. It all comes from building them up from the fatty acids that we're talking about. So this is why, the reason why membranes need to be liquid one of the things that shows this to me is why trans fats are bad. Trans fats are bad because they make your lip membranes more solid. And that is that goes back to the basic biochemistry of it. The trans fats will pack together better and they will be more solid. Their melting temperature will be raised so that they, um, they stick together more. So for example, you're probably familiar with the kind of experiments we feed rats olive oil and they have lower blood pressure. So they tested this, but instead of olive oil, they fed them different oleic acids, okay? They fed them cis oleic acid, trans oleic acid, or soybean oil, which has no oleic acid at all. And it turns out of these three possibilities, the cis oleic acid rats had lower blood pressure. And they went and they looked at the chemistry of it and they found that the sisoleic rats had more liquid membranes. They flowed more, they were able to respond to the environment better, and their receptors worked better. That's how much it matters. Because the receptors don't work as well when there's a lot of transmembrane uh, fats in the membrane, that is one of the reasons why blood pressure signals don't get through the membrane as well. It's kind of amazing to me that this matters, but the, the trans versus cis according to this experiment, does matter. And sending a signal depends on getting that signal through the membrane. And that depends on a bunch of uh, conformational changes that depend on a liquid membrane. Pretty cool. So, um, just like rat cells need to be uh, have mem membranes that are fluid, E. coli have the same structure of membranes, and they do the same thing. What they do is E. coli will actually grow. As it grows, it will keep its membrane in the fluid state by either making more saturated lipids if it's, um, if it's one temperature or more unsaturated lipids if it's the other temperature. So check out how this works. So we have palmitate, oleic acid, and palmitoleic acid, which is the version of palmitate with a single point of unsaturation. And as the E. coli grow in warmer temperatures, look what happens. They get more palmitic acid and they get less uh, oleic acid. So they're losing points of saturation. They're gaining unsaturated lipids. When they are cold, they need more unsaturated lipids to kick out their legs. Remember the example of little Ben and kicking out his legs as he's sleeping and taking up more of the bed.
the whole idea is that you have the uh, ratio of unsaturated to saturated is you have more unsaturated um, uh, amino acids at colder temperatures precisely because the unsaturated things makes them more liquid. There's a point of liquidity that the membrane tries to maintain. And the way it can maintain that is just by making double bonds. So if you step back and look at a membrane, you see the, all this lateral motion. But you see an interesting thing about it. If you start chasing, a, if you label a certain protein, like with the same kind of experiment we talked about before, train a microscope on it and follow that protein as it moves around, you'll see that it will stay in the purple region, and then all of a sudden it will jump to the blue region and move around. Then it will jump to the green region and move around, and finally it will jump to this yellow region and move around. It looks like it's staying in a certain area until it jumps over a fence, and it's like we have a fence right here and a fence right there. And it looks like physically that's actually a pretty good model. We do have areas that are sort of fenced off in the membrane. And what could account for that? Well, if we look at the cytoskeleton, it looks like it has a pattern that would explain this. The cytoskeleton is on the inside of the membrane, and it's a bunch of little spider webs of fibrous proteins that are arranged, but they have these domains between them where you can, you can see that these form the fences between these, um, these different things. Now, the, the other thing is that the lipids are not tied down to the cytoskeleton. Some proteins are tied down to it. For example, here's two proteins. Doesn't matter which ones. I'm not even going to say their names. Doesn't matter. But you see that they are actually tied to the, act, uh, to the actin skeleton. So the cell can move those around by moving the actin and the rest of the lipids flow around it. It's like they're anchored, okay? So you see that you have these two effects of the proteins that are anchored, and then you have this effect where you have the cytoskeleton forming these little patches that appear to be free movement within the patch, but some kind of barrier to move in between the patches. And so the way they explain that is they, say, they see that there's lots of proteins attached to the actin on the inside. And these proteins go through the lipid bilayer and they form this sort of fence. It's not a completely impermeable fence, it's, it's a porous fence, but it allows some movement, but it restricts movement somewhat. And so you have these different membrane patches that are about 500 nanometers square. They're not really square, they're any shape they want to be but they're about 500 nanometers on a side, let's say. And you can see the consequences of this movement is that the cell actually has this pretty complicated structure on the outside. It's not just freely diffusing, but you have these different areas with picket fences between them. So the cool thing is about membranes, they are essentially liquid, and liquid dissolves liquid. If you push two membranes close enough together, the liquids will dissolve and the membranes will fuse. Two cells will become one. If you push a liposome into a membrane, the liposome will fuse with the membrane. And once, it, once you get past the head groups being organized and stuff like that, once you get the fatty acids being able to contact, they're like, oh boy, hydrophobic interactions. Let's all dissolve. And that's what, that's what happens for all these complex biological processes. Exocytosis, endocytosis, sperm moving in, fusing with the egg, and small plants, they have vacuoles that move around. This is all based, and of course, I shouldn't miss out viral infection. SARS-CoV-2 has a viral membrane, has a uh, lipid membrane around it that helps hold it together. That dissolves into your membrane when the virus infects one of your cells. And if that sounds invasive, that's because it is. And viruses, um, the, the really good news, completely off topic. Today, um, I got the best solid news in science that I think I've had since the whole pandemic. We do have what looks like a 90, 95% chance of being a really good vaccine already. I thought it would take till December. So that just goes to show you, uh, it looks like we might, we might have a vaccine widespread within two to four months. Isn't that good news?
It's one of the days where I'm actually glad I'm on Twitter, because that's how I hear about it. Anyways, hopefully we can stop that virus from fusing its membrane with ours by using the vaccine to train our immune system. But that's why you should keep up with biochemistry. I can tell you about really cool things like that, too. Here's a, just another picture of it that shows saturated chains are going to be non-fluid. They don't really say solid because that's not really right, accurate to say. But speaking to me, I can say less fluid, more solid. Okay, you'll let me get away with that, right? Unsaturated chains will be sort of too messed up, but sterols will help sort of be the happy medium to help all of these things fit together and still be liquid. And the cell actually controls this. We talked about how bacteria control their cellular, uh, uh, their membrane fluidity by making different amino, uh, different fatty acids. Okay, um, it, your mitochondria do the same thing. Here's a case where there's, and actually I gotta make sure this is mitochondria. Yeah, I'm sure this is mitochondria. Oh, well, they did, I'm sorry, they did this to E. coli. I'm sure that this could work in mitochondria, but I should read my own slide. They did this in E. coli, and the thing is, E. coli and mitochondria are very biochemically similar. It's hard to tell them apart. So let's, let me be accurate about this. They did this in E. coli. E. coli runs mitochondrial-type cellular respiration machinery in its, um, in its shell, in its membrane. And so just like it modulates the fluidity of its membrane by doing saturated or unsaturated, what they did is they scientists added the gene that makes unsaturated lipids. You see right here it is making those unsaturated lipids, and they're being incorporated now, 14 colon 1, 16 colon 1, 18 colon 1, incorporated more into the membrane. When you express this gene, you have a more liquid membrane. And so they were able to correlate. Look at the axes on this. The y-axis is how many double bonds do you have in your membrane? And that's controlled by the amount of FABB that you have that makes the double bonds. Then they added arabinose, and they found out that arabinose is a sugar source. The bacteria combusts the sugar and gets energy from it. When they had more acyl chains, you know, the, uh, the arabinose that they added um, they, they added more arabinose, and the arabinose uh, gave them more energy. Um, the arabinose was transport. I believe this is arabinose transport. This is why I get for not putting the figure on it. Um, but you see that the, the acyl chains, yes, this, this is arabinose transport. The uh, more acyl chains you have unsaturated, the more fluid the membrane is, and the more arabinose will get inside the cell. I believe that's how it works. This is the important one that I know how this one works. Because remember that E. coli has uh, oxidative machinery. This is the machinery that takes electrons and turns them, puts the electrons on water, consumes oxygen, combines the electrons with oxygen, makes water and energy. The thing about this whole process is bacteria do it with two enzymes that are separated by the membrane. What they do is they send the electrons, they collect the electrons with this one on the left, they put the electrons on this lipid, which is called Q. It's a quinone electron carrier. It dissolves in the membrane and it carries the electrons over to cytochrome C. Or this is actually cytochrome BC. This is cytochrome... It's a cytochrome. I really should probably put more information on these. What matters is that this is the copper containing enzyme that will actually react with oxygen and the electrons react with oxygen, but they need to travel through the membrane to get there. So what they found is when they added all sorts of different sugar sources, doesn't matter what kind of sugar source you add, these four different sugars, they got a consistent pattern the more unsaturated uh, things you have, the higher your respiration rate. The more unsaturated things you have, the more fluid your membrane. And the way they explained that, the more fluid your membrane, the more liquid it is, and the faster this QH2 can swim through it to complete the process of burning the sugar.
and it works no matter whether you use glucose, succinate, whether you use, um, oh boy, I don't even know what that is. Pure, uh, that would be whatever glu uh, sugar source you use. Use glycerol over here, and this would be pyruvate. Any carbon source you use, the more fluid bacteria chewed it up better. And that fits exactly with the fact that this Q has to swim through the membrane. And a more liquid membrane is easier to swim through. More electrons, higher rate of respiration. All of these topics are going to be covered in much more detail in Biochem 2. So I encourage you to take that if you're curious about all this. So just a couple more things about membranes and then we're pretty much uh, we're going to be done with this lecture. But we should talk about how proteins can be compatible with the membranes, how they can be embedded in the membrane and dissolved in it. So you can, uh, for example, you can have a transmembrane embedded protein and you can even find out where the protein fits into the membrane just by looking at its primary sequence. For example, if you see a big long stretch of amino acids, see between uh, amino acid 74 and 95, you have this big long stretch and it turns out that this is exactly the length that you need to make an alpha helix that will be the exact width of the membrane. That is a really strong sign that that may be a transmembrane domain. Realize that you can ha have other clues that you can look for as well. You can have some uh, loops that interact with like the head groups or are partially buried. Uh, and those can be clues. You can find the sequence patterns for those. One of the other things is once you've found the transmembrane alpha helix, you can say, okay, I know which side is outside and which side is inside. My amino terminus is either going to be outside or inside. How do I know? Well, one way to tell, look for phosphorylation sites. Look for glycosylation sites, I should say, not phosphorylation. Glycosylation sites are all going to be outside. So if you have a bunch of glycosylation sites, on, uh, in residues 1 through 60 on the amino terminus, you can say, I think my protein has this arrangement. And then you can do an experiment to find out if that's really true. The other thing you can look for, you can look for glycosylation sites. You can also look for protease sites. Or you can do the experiment where you have a cell with the protein in it. You throw a protease at it. But the protease can only attack on the outside of the cell. And then you run a gel and you see which parts of your protein got chewed up. That is one way to show this domain must be on the outside because it was chewed up by the protease. Notice that you can even see with your own eyes that those amino acids are really hydrophobic and they're exactly the right length and they're, uh, they might even have alpha helical propensity. If you have a hydrophobic alpha helix that is a, uh, the right length to span a membrane, then uh, yeah, it's a very strong sign that this is where the where it's anchored. So remember that I talked briefly about how you have the chemical composition of the membrane. You can have proteins that interact with that. You can have peripheral proteins that interact with charges on the head groups or charges on transmembrane proteins. And so um, those are going to be loosely bound. Or you can have proteins like the one we showed right here that are embedded in the membrane. These are going to be more tightly bound. So sort of peripheral proteins versus integral proteins is the difference we're talking about here. If you have a protein that associates with the membrane, but all it takes to get it off is adding a little pH change or adding a chelating agent, a chelating agent will suck up all the metals. It will bind, one of them is called EDTA. And that's just a chemical that chelates calcium. It pulls all the calcium out. And so you see right here, sometimes you can have calcium forming bridges, but that's a relatively weak interaction. It's relatively easy to get a peripheral protein to pull it off the membrane. If you try all these things and it doesn't come out of the membrane, then you're starting to think it might be integral. The only way to really get an integral protein out of the membrane is to add a detergent. And remember that we talked about that way back in the x-ray crystallography lecture that you have the Nobel Prize for the person who figured out a detergent can act as a surrogate membrane and it can surround and solubilize an integral protein. So that's the key. What kind of chemical does it take to get that protein off? 
So you have, um, you can have a uh, phospholipase. Uh, also, the other thing is sometimes a phospholipase will clip off a protein. If you have that, then what you're thinking is phospholipases, they cut up lipids, right? There are some proteins that have little covalently bound lipids on them. And those lipids will sort of serve as a single lipid anchor to the membrane. The thing is, you can snip this cord by using a phospholipase. If you have that, then you have what is probably a lipid anchored protein. One of the common kinds of lipid anchored proteins is GPI linked proteins. I have a picture of that lipid. It's a particular lipid called GPI. So here's a peripheral protein called the nexin. This binds the charged lipid head group. So you can see all the cholines right there, right? You can see all the positive charges those must represent. What's interesting about it is it also requires calcium. Calcium can provide charges that help it fit together as well. And the cell can use that for signaling, like it can take the calcium away and the protein falls off. Or you can actually, you can take the calcium away by adding a chemical that takes the calcium away, like EDTA. This is what a peripheral membrane protein looks like, easy to pull off. And this is what a lipid anchored protein looks like. So you actually have some lipid anchors that work on the inside of cells these are more complicated, and I don't, I don't intend for you to remember these, but I do want you to remember what a GPI anchor is, because I found it important for my research, and it's the kind of thing I wish I had known when I was your age. A GPI anchor is a special lipid anchor that works on the outside of cells. And so a lot of cells will have this complicated GPI anchor, but it's a lipid, and it's a sort of two acyl chain lipid. It's got this head group, it's got an inositol head group, and then it's covalently bound through all this mess that you don't have to really know, but it's covalently bound through sugars and phosphates to a protein. And so um, it's an important link, and you can cleave it with a specific enzyme that cleaves GPI anchors. And it will move around the membrane like a lipid will, because you know the lipids have lateral diffusion. So when you look at integral membrane proteins, there are really a couple of different kinds that you see. And I actually don't want you to pay attention to the ones over here. I just want you to pay attention to the ones that are in the middle here. There's type 1, type 2, type 3, and type 5. Type 1 and type 2 are pretty straightforward. Type 1 has the amino terminus on the outside and one transmembrane domain. Type 2 is just that flipped on its head. It has the amino terminus on the inside. Notice, by the way, they put the inside on the top. I don't like it when they do that. It confuses me. But there it is. We've got to go by it. Type 3 have multiple transmembrane domains. For example, the seven helix um, transmembrane domains, they're very common. And so those would be type 3 if it's a single chain. And sometimes you have multiple transmembrane domains that are held together. They're in multiple chains, and they're held together in a sort of quaternary structure. That would be type 5. So the real di the thing to remember is type 1 versus type 2, and type 3 versus type 5. So for example, if I show you this protein, you'll be able to look at it and say, oh, that's all one chain, multiple transmembrane domains, therefore it is a type 3 uh, integral membrane protein. In fact, this is bacterial rhodopsin, which is related to your rhodopsin, but the bacteria don't use it to see. It's just interesting, they use it as a proton pore. So it, change, it does change in response to light, and it lets protons through. Bacteria use it for their membranes. We use it in our eyes. And therefore, from that, you might be able to figure out. Our eye cells have lots of membranes inside them. They have extra membranes inside the cells. Isn't that weird? But it's partially because rhodopsin is a membrane protein. You see right here is a type 3. So like if you took a, if you made a plot of residue number by hydrophobic nature of that residue and you did some sort of averaging to sort of say hydrophobicity of that region, you would get what's called a hydropathy plot. And you would have the more higher up it is, the more hydrophobic that part of the membrane is. This is just based on primary structure. But if you just have the gene and the primary structure of rhodopsin and you put it on a hydropathy plot, you see you have these 
seven hydrophobic regions that are all about the same length. This was evidence for how they knew what bacteria rhodopsin looked like before they could get a structure. So like if you see this, I'll give this to you as a question. You see this, what, what two types of protein, of transmembrane uh, protein, could this be? So you see the yellow area, it's about the same width. You see it's about 20, 30 residues. It's about the same width as these. So it looks like this would be a single membrane crossing alpha helix. And so that would narrow it down to be either type 1 or type 2. We'd have to do some further tests to figure out which, uh, which residue, which terminus was on the outside versus the inside. So when you see all these embedded integral membrane uh, proteins, you can look at them from the side. And I just want to remind you, the inside, the parts inside the membrane will always be hydrophobic because the inside of a membrane is itself hydrophobic. And you can even plot out like charged versus uncharged. Uncharged residues are gray. Charged residues are blue. And tryptophan and tyrosines are red and orange. And if you look at this, there's a very distinct pattern. It's not a 100% pattern, but it's very distinct. You can hang your hat on it. You have the charged residues on the outside of the cell contacting the water and on the inside contacting water. Very few on the, on, uh, inside the membrane. And if you look at the head groups, it looks like tryptophan and tyrosine, so the charged residues are outside the membrane. Tyrosine or tryptophan are at the water lipid interface. It looks like those interact well with head groups, and those can interact well with hydrophobic. They have hydrophobic and hydrophilic parts. They're sort of amphipathic. And the uncharged residues are the inside. That's what the colors of this graph show you for five different integral membrane proteins. Because of that, you can imagine how they go. And you can imagine if I pulled on the protein that it would be sort of, it would be hard. It would be sort of elastic, stretchy. It'd be sort of fluid. So the protein is able to stay inside the membrane against a lot of force. You know, those proteins are pretty well embedded in the membrane. By the way, you can look at these on YouTube to see more of them. It looks like this is something that I just saw, and it's really cool. It looks like membrane proteins actually make themselves more or less fluid, and they, make, they change their hydrophobic shapes to be able to sort of move through the membrane pa faster. Look at this. On the left, you have a conventionally diffusing membrane that will, uh, a protein in the membrane that will move around normally. They notice there are some proteins that will actually be like speedsters. They'll be able to diffuse really quickly. And so they show accelerated diffusion. And then when they looked at the structure of these, they found out they didn't fit perfectly in the membrane. They actually had a distortion which made their shape be sort of like a, a protrusive shape is what they called it right there. And that allows them to sort of, it's like the keel of a ship. It allows it to push through and diffuse through the membrane more quickly. That's really cool, but it's a biophysical consequence of shape. And that's why I want to focus on it here. So the last thing to talk about is that you have these thick rafts of sphingolipids usually and more cholesterol. These make thick little floating rafts in, uh, or, or islands that move around, and these also laterally diffuse. Look at them from the side. You can see that they are enriched in cholesterol and sphingolipids, and the GPI anchor is compatible with sphingolipids. So that means you'll have GPI anchored proteins in these lipid rafts moving around with the raft. And so that's got to be important to how the cells signal and how they, they do these other things. When you look at the patterns, you see some amazing patterns. Because these rafts are thicker, they will sort of tilt in the membrane. And that will set up a sort of spiral vortex. So if you uh, look at a cell and how all the lipids are moving, you don't just have random mo movement. You actually have some sort of spiral whirlpools and vortexes that are set up. Here's one where they were actually changing the temperature and they saw 28 degrees Celsius, you got this big vortex 
that they show is rainbow colored here is just showing that part of the membrane is spinning around. And so I want you to have this figure, this idea that membranes can move. And that means you can insult them uh, with some pretty big chemical or physical insults and they will recover. For example, here is a, uh, this is a computer simulation of what electroporation works like. If you've done electroporation, what you do is you shock a sample of cells and it opens up holes in their membrane, but then those holes close again once the shock pass. This is because the membrane itself is liquid and it will close up automatically. This is what a model of it looks like on this, the atomic level. You shock it and you get these big holes in it, but then you let, um, after the, the insult passes, the holes fill in liquid-like. So it's really cool to actually see, oh yeah, we are literally perforating the membrane with electric charge, which allows us to pass things like plasmids into the cell. So if you can have um, electric shock can form holes, you can have a protein that makes a hole. For example, here's a beta barrel. Uh, it's a big hole in the membrane. And the inside of this beta barrel can be hydrophilic and it can even hold an entire small protein. This is such a big membrane protein, an entire other protein will fit inside. So we've got proteins inside our proteins, okay? It's kind of meta. So you can see that you have these big, uh, these big beta barrel type proteins that will punch big holes in the membrane. And exa for example, if you look over here, the alpha hemolysin toxin. Well, that doesn't sound good, does it? The toxin itself, this is produced by certain um, microbes. I think I have, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure which microbes use it, so I'm not going to be wrong and say which ones do, but it's a toxin encoded by something infectious that punches holes in your cells. How does it encode this huge protein inside the cell? Well, it does it in seven parts. So in fact, it makes seven proteins that look like this in part A. When they approach a membrane together, this little orange part flips out and the seven orange parts wrap up to form hydrogen bonds to form a 14-stranded beta barrel that makes a big hole in the membrane that lets the entire, it punches a hole in the membrane and the entire guts of the cell that it's attacking spill out through the hole. I just think that's really cool. So you can build good proteins based on the same principle rather than that bad protein. Here's a um, protein, this is like a big beta barrel that's showing it transporting a whole protein and it's showing it holding a column of water. I just think that looks cool, so I just had to show it to you. But that shows you that you can make the big holes if you regulate the holes carefully so they aren't just punching holes in the membrane willy-nilly. If you open and close them carefully, you can use this as a transport protein. And so you can make big holes in the protein and membrane proteins when you do the crystal structures of these, you find out that sometimes there's lipids that are still stuck to the protein. These must be really tightly bound. The cool thing about it is it gives us a picture of where the membrane is and how the protein sits in the membrane. And look at this. You have the phospholipids. Here's sheep aquaporin, a water channel. And you've got all these hydrophobic fatty acid chains stuck to it. And you've got all the head groups on top and bottom. You can imagine how that fits into the membrane. Here is a big hollow protein that fits in the membrane, and you can see how the membrane sort of fills in the hollow, and you can see the width of it is about right, and you have the hydrophobic parts on the inside. This is the FO region that is part of the um, ATPase that is crucial in oxi oxidative respiration. Again, you're gonna talk about that in um, Biochem 2. So the very last thing, to, we've reached the end of, the, of this lecture. The very last thing is I promised I would tell you what cardiolipin would do. So these frozen in place lipids are called annular lipids. That means that they're very tightly bound. And cardiolipin is actually an annular lipid for two different proteins. The left side is annular to one protein, 
the right side is annular to another one. That means that this is a staple that literally holds two proteins together. I think of it as a lipid staple, even looks like a staple, and it's found in um, mitochondria. If it's not in mitochondria, the mitochondria don't function as well because the complexes of the mitochondria are not held together as well. So cardiolipin literally holds you together. You can see from the cardio, it's important to the heart, which is where the mitochondria are perhaps most important. And so we literally see this bridging two different proteins with its two different lipid um, tails, pairs of lipids is what they are. So that's really cool. Okay, and that is the end of chapter 11. Thanks for sticking around for this asynchronous lecture. Uh, I will see you in class on Friday, and we'll start talking about something completely different. We're going to talk about nucleic acids. Two more lectures of new material, one lecture of review, then you've got a long break before the final, like five days. Don't forget that we have a reading quiz, so start looking forward, um, looking ahead to chapter eight. You are ready to do all the homework, sapling, lineager, and foundations, and it's all in sapling if you have any questions. All right, thanks everyone. Hope you have a good break, and I will see you on Friday, if not before.